So now this next chapter deals with uh, fluid kinematics. Uh, there's a lot in here. Let me just try and describe it. We have two great descriptions of fluids. One is the Eulerian. That's the one we like. When we talk about the Eulerian description of a fluid, we talk about a flow field, and we talk about the velocity field, we talk about the acceleration field, meaning at every point in some sort of grid, I can talk about the velocity and acceleration of the fluid that's traveling through it. But a millisecond later, or 10 seconds later, or whatever, there's another chunk of fluid at that same location. All right. Material derivative, you get this big D, big D, and you're going to take the derivative. It's essentially a time derivative. And this is funny notation, the material derivative. This is one of those key things. You don't want to get out of this class. And you say, oh, you took uh, fluid mechanics. Yes, I did. You know, I took fluid mechanics. I never really understood the material derivative. Can you please explain to me the material derivative? And you say, never heard of it. Wrong answer. No, no, no. This is one of these important concepts in fluid mechanics. And what it does is it links together the sum of the forces equal ma a kind of Lagrangian description of fluid mechanics where you're t applying the principles to chunks of fluids as they flow through the flow field. I'm trying to give it to you, the bottom line, the answer. But you're going to describe it in a Eulerian or on a grid. So you're going to talk about material uh, acceleration, but at a grid location, not tracking chunks of fluid masses. I'll repeat that again later, but this is going to be one of those key things. There's a lot of descriptions of fluids. Streamlines and stream tubes are the big ones that you just got to get an idea of. A lot of our are 2D. A lot of them are steady, and they just become um, simple. It's, it's just track that chunk of fluid and show me where it goes as it flows through. Connect all the points starting at time zero to end time, and there's my line. That's a streamline. Put a stream tube. Put a little uh, zone around that chunk. All right. Uh, we'll talk about fields. So we can plot the temperature field. That's a scalar field. We often visualize it by putting lines of constant temperature, isotherms. Do the same thing for the scale field of pressure. This is why the engineering analysis class is so important. All right, so we have uh, lines of constant pressure in a 2 or 3D you know, plot. And uh, if it's a 3D plot, you have surfaces of constant pressure. In a 2D plot, lines of constant pressure. But then you get to talk about the fluid velocity and the fluid acceleration. I need to do a vector plot, not a scalar plot like temperature and pressure, but a vector plot because I have vector entities at all these points. Then we talk about how fluid deforms. Four great deformations, translation, rotation, linear strain, and shear strain. Talk about vorticity, how it rotates. Some flows have rotational aspects to them, which are important, some not. So you have rotational or irrotational. Rotational or irrotational. Irrotational means not rotating flow field. And then another big one, which unfortunately some people who taught fluid mechanics say, nah, I don't cover the Reynolds transport theorem. What? Okay, well, you better get to being able to do a mass balance, energy balance, linear and angular momentum balance. You could do an entropy balance. You could do whatever balances. But the Reynolds transport theorem is uh, very fun, uh, commonly discussed in fluid mechanics literature because it's a general statement of how to get these balance. It's a general derivation strategy for these balance statements. And the three that we need to come out of this section with is mass, something about mass. It's conserved. There's a balance statement. Energy, well, if you can keep track of the flows in and out, it's conserved. But you got its bookkeeping. The Reynolds transport theorem helps us with the bookkeeping. And then the momentum, same thing. Okay? All right, it's bookkeeping. Well, 
uh, I've probably spent too much time on where we're going, but um, you're going to have to read the cha chapter. When you're confronted with a new word, did I tell you what I do? I go to the dictionary. So if I just type in define kinematics, it's the branch of mechanics concerned with the motion of objects without reference to the forces or moments that cause the motion. Have you seen that word before? That's why this class, this is the table of contents out of dynamics textbook that we use. Hibbler's dynamics textbook. How many people recall? Guess what? Look at the title of this chapter. Kinematics of a particle. A whole chapter. Then all you do is particle, 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 and you probably think dynamics is pretty boring. And then you get to chapter 16 after chapter 15. What's uh, chapter 16 deal with? Kinematics of a body. Hold it. What's the difference between the chapter 12 Kinematics, same word. Kinematics of a particle versus kinematics of a body. You got, yeah, you got some mass moment of inertia now with the body. And you're going to have to not just a translational, you're going to have a rotational component. And then you have moments of forces. But then look at the parallel. You have, all right, we're going to have the... Force, acceleration, body, so planar kinetics of a body. Take a look at this one. Kinetics, force and acceleration of a particle. It's like 13's parallel with 17. And then here's the planar kinetics of rigid body, work and energy methods to analyze it. Guess what? You had work and energy methods right here. Work and energy methods for a particle. And then the same thing down here, I didn't really copy it too well, impulse and momentum. And you go back here, and there's impulse and momentum for a particle. So I know that dynamics was a tough class. And fluid mechanics is statics, fluid statics plus fluid dynamics. And we're prim primarily into fluid dynamics now, and it's a tough class. <laughs> okay. But don't be ashamed to go back and get this excellent textbook off the shelf. Open it up and review concepts. So there's uh, two large descriptions of fluids, Lagrangian or Larian. And you can just Google it, take a look at the Wikipedia page, read our textbook, read other sources, whatever you is. But it's a way of looking at fluid motion where in Lagrangian, which we don't spend a lot of time on, but we talk about it, but it's really important, is that it's tracking the particular parcels or packets of fluids through the space as a function of time. The Eulerian, I know that they're trying to honor Lagrange and Euler with continuation of their names, right? Do you know we have uh, the same thing going on in academia? You make a couple million, hundred million dollars, you would like to give it back and get a building named after you. Then for many, many years, people have to pronounce your name and again and again and again, put it in their letters and everything else. You know, I'm studying in the Herbert blah, 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 uh, College of Engineering at the blah, blah, blah. You see that? We don't, we don't have our College of Engineering named. But why? because they won't take my $10. <laughs> they won't take my $10, and I want my name permanently attached, and then every one of you have to say you graduated from the blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, no, you need about, I don't know, 10 million will do it, for sure. Wait a couple more years, no, the price went up. Price went up. <laughs> so anyway, we're trying to honor these people, and so it makes it, I think, sometimes a little more difficult for students because they have to translate between the name of an individual who's long gone and then what it me really means. But this is the, what we're describing. We're focusing on specific locations of, in the space, in the zone, in a grid. And then we talk about what's happening to not just one fluid particle, but 
all bunch of them that flow through that same zone or, or uh, point. All right. So these are the two great descriptions, and uh, I hate to say it, but please, you have to read it. It's nothing that somebody can just easily explain to you. I did my best. You have a bunch of multiple choice questions. In the interest of time, I've answered these questions in the previous lectures. Can you just go look at it? I know that I'm passing the buck here a little bit, but you have a pressure field. Think of two-dimensional. It's really hard to show 3D pressure fields. In 2D, we could talk about a function of X and Y, and we could talk about the pressure here, the pressure here, the pressure here, and then you can connect lines of constant pressure, lines of constant pressure. Velocity field. Well, at every point that I'm interested in, I have a little vector which is the fluid chunk at that location at that instant in time is now heading in that direction with that speed. That's it. And then the same thing, you could have an acceleration field. So it's being accelerated as well at that instant in that direction with that acceleration. And so you get pretty complicated diagrams of pressure contours, thermal contours, um, velocity vector fields and acceleration vector fields. Okay, you just need to work with some of these. Like here is a velocity as a function of x, so that's v is equal to u as a function of x, y, i plus v as a function of x, y, j. This is like a 2D example, two dimensional example. So u is the X component, V is the Y component, but they're a function of location, X and Y. Here's a made up example. What does it, you know, you can ask a question. The velocity equals zero at the location where? Well, if the velocity vector equals a zero, then each component must equal to zero. That's not an equal sign, that's a plus. True. And then you just look at it and you make the call. Say that's equal to zero, that's equal to zero, and you pick the right answer. Yeah, the velocity described here, the velocity at the location, blah, give it to me. Well, you just put in x of equal to 1, <coughs> y equal to 2, <coughs> and you can calculate that velocity as a vector. And if the particle starts at this location with the, where is the particle a very short time later? This is a, probably the best question. I'm talking about a little later. What's a little later? 0.01 seconds. What is that? How many milliseconds is 0.01 second? 10 milliseconds. Uh, anybody have an idea of some things? How long is 10 milliseconds? It's very fast, right? So it's a very short time period. And so if you're interested in a very short time period and you know the location of the object, where is it at in a short time later? Would the new location at time t plus delta t equal to the original location at time t plus what? It's the velocity times the time. Isn't that it? And so these are now vector entities, and you can work that out. This is a great little example to do, okay? Same velocity field. The velocity at this location in units of meters per second, you can calculate it. Just put in the x and put in the y. The, velocity, the particle velocity changed as it travels from this location to that new location. The did the particle velocity change as it traveled from that location to that location? Well, this is the new location, and you're going to get a slightly different velocity. Okay? So the V at 2 is not equal to the V at 1. 
Now the question is, is did the particle experience some acceleration or deceleration, negative ac acceleration? Yeah. And if it did, what is, how could I calculate the acceleration? How could I calculate the acceleration? Well, what is it? Is dv dt. So why, did, why don't I just put v2 minus v1 divided by delta t? Would that work? Sure. This is just kind of beefing up the kinematics. I think it's easy, but I'm, I've taught the class before, and some students, probably half the class, really need to do this. Make up a different example and work through it as well. Newton's second law applies to each fluid particle as it travels through a flow field. True or false? Do you like that law, F equal ma? If I'm focused on a chunk of fluid, does that always work? Yeah, it's true, it's true, it's true. Newton's law applies to every point in the flow field. Remember, we have the Lagrangian or the Eulerian description. Does F equal ma to a point? in the flow field, not the chunk of mass that flows through that point, but to the point. Nope, it does not. F equal ma applies to a point of mass, of mass m, that flows through the field. Well, then it brings us to the big material derivative. That I, do you remember that I said the material derivative looks like in equation format? It has a very funny notation that's unique to fluid mechanics. Professor, that's a new derivative you're showing me. But I have retained my calculus textbook. I didn't sell it back to the bookstore. And last night I opened it and I searched and I searched and I searched for this brand new derivative. It's not in there. What are you trying to teach us? You know, this is kind of little, is this quackery here? Mathematical quackery? You know, call out the mathematician police and arrest you? Well, this is a notation introduced to help keep straight the difference between this derivative and something like the derivative with respect to time. Because is this the same t? It sure is. It's time. But you also have something else. Something else right here. It's going to be the, the velocity dotted with del operating on the something that we're operating on. So whatever it operates on goes you know, one place on the left-hand side of the equal sign and two places on the right-hand side of the equal sign. So this question mark, you can fill in with a number of different things. You can fill in with temperature. That's probably the easiest thing to understand. Just fill in with something like temperature. But later you'll fill in with pressure and even velocity. But it gets a little abstract or harder. So think about temperature, temperature, temperature. Now, this big D really is just compact notation for a longer expression. You're exactly right. It's just compact notation for a longer expression. So let's take a look at the longer expression. What about the first part of this longer expression of the material derivative? What does that look like? Well, it looks like whatever function, I'm talking time is a function of, uh, temperature is a function of time and location. It looks like a partial derivative with respect to time. I know how to do partial derivatives. And then what about over here? What is this V? I should have put a notation on top, just like this symbol right here with a notation on top. All right, who wants to uh, tell me, you know, what this is? What is that called? It's the del operator. And a lot of times we can take the grad. Uh, 
the gradient of a scalar field like temperature or write it like del operating on T but you can also take and compute the divergence of a velocity field uh, that uses the del but it's del dot V or you can do the curl of V and uh, what did that? There's the del cross V. Hold it. This del, that del, that del. Are they all the same del? Exactly the same del. So the del is the del operator. Uh, what is that? Do you remember what del was from your previous class? That's right, the partial with respect to x i plus the partial with respect to y j plus the partial with respect to z k. Professor, I'd like to work in another coordinate system other than in you know, a rectangular i j k. Great, look it up in the appendix. Okay, let's just get i j k in the Cartesian coordinate system. Life is hard enough, isn't it? All right, now. This is del, so I can take and del operates with T, a scalar field, del dot something, a vector field, or del cross something, but it's still del, all three of those. And that's what goes right here. But this is very unique notation because, Professor, I remember the gradient divergence curl. I remember doing this, 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 but uh, V dot del? I looked up my other book, and I don't, what is going on here? Just treat it as the dot product of two vectors. What is the vector V? Ui, Vj, plus Wk. Dotted with the partial with respect to Xi, partial with respect to Yj, partial with respect to Zk. Now, this is waiting to operate on something. It's waiting to operate on this question mark right here, which I said maybe think about temperature, but you can feed it a lot of different things. And it's, being, it's ready to feed it right there, right there, and right there. But this is the V dot del ready to operate on something. So what you can do is, I'm sorry I ran out of room, U partial U, uh, the partial of something with respect to x plus v, partial of something with respect to y, plus w, partial of something with respect to z. That's that compact notation to, to expand that out. So this is the material derivative. It's compact notation for feed me here and I'll be able to make kind of like two parts. This first part hmm, looks like the traditional partial derivative with respect to time. You're exactly right. What about this part? Uh, brand new to fluid mechanics, right? Uh, well, that one is due to the sweeping part of the flow field. That's what we call the advective acceleration. The first part, I don't know if I have it time there, is the local acceleration. Local here and advective acceleration there. All of that's just sort of name calling and showing you the math. What does it mean? Well, let me do this. Let me give you a quick derivation of it, and then, or no, let me jump to this. This material derivative, you can just Google it, see the Wikipedia page, read about it. But if you take a look at the Wiki Wikipedia page, it's used in continuum mechanics. This is a fancy thing for not just fluid mechanics, but solid mechanics. It's broad mechanics. But right now, think of fluid. It's heavily used in fluid mechanics. It's the material derivative describes the rate of change of some physical quantity like temperature or 
momentum. Instead of heat, I would say temperature or momentum. For a natural, uh, I'm sorry, a material element subjected to space-time dependent macroscopic velocity field. There's that field again. It's flowing through some field. Material derivative can serve as a link between Eulerian and Lagrangian. Hey, there's those two words again. Description of the continuum deformation. So for, for fluid mechanics, it takes the case that the velocity field under consideration is the flow velocity itself and the quantity interested in is the temperature of the fluid. Then the material derivative describes the temperature evolution of a certain fluid packet or parcel in time as it is being moved along a trajectory, along that path line. Guess what? It has more than one name. It's called advective derivative, convective derivative, derivative following the motion. I like it. The hydrodynamic derivative, not so much. I don't like it that much. Lagrangian derivative, I don't like it as much. But people have called it that, the same thing. The particle derivative, I like that one. The subst substantial derivative, I don't like that one as much. Substantive derivative, I don't like that one as much. Stokes derivative, no, too many names, right? I know we'd like to honor Stokes, but. And the total derivative, mm, I kind of like the derivative following the motion of the pack of fluid. I like, I, it's, you have the advective component or the convective component of the derivative included with the temporal component. So I like the material derivative. I, I like this derivative of uh, particle derivative. I like this longer name, uh, but there's a lot of names for this thing. All right. Now let's go back and try to make a quick derivation of this derivative. How do we get this derivative? All right. Well, it's best to think of temperature as a function of time and location with that. And we're interested in how it changes at a particular location. So if somebody said, but the location, x is a function of time, and y is a function of time, and z is a function of time. So if I'm interested in the total change of temperature with respect to time, it's as if I take the partial of t with respect to time right there, but then I need to add in the partial of t with respect to space times the partial of space with respect to time, plus the partial of t with respect to y times the partial of y with respect to time, plus the partial of t with respect to z times the partial of z with respect to time, and maybe I should have, for parallelism, said I'll just do the partial of t with respect to t. That's kind of, what did I multiply by one? Just multiply by one. But, but mathematically, what does this look like, what we've done? Mathematically. There's only a few things you have to remember out of calculus. I think you've employed the something rule, the rope rule. The chain rule. That's not the rope rule. It's the chain rule. Right? And then you say, well, if x is a function of t and I take the change in the x, the location of the particle with respect to time, that's u. And this is v. And this is, what is that? I have no idea. That's terrible. Uh, the partial of, what did I write? z. Z, there you go. So what is that? That's W. So we get that UVW times the partial of T with respect to X, the partial of T with respect to Y, the partial of T with respect to Z. And we're back to what we had for the material derivative. It's math. OK. There's, you can write it for temperature. You can even write it for velocity. But that gets a little tricky because 
you have um, the of v dt is equal to the partial of v with respect to time plus u, the x component of velocity, times the partial of the velocity with respect to x plus v, the partial of v with respect to y plus w, the partial of v with respect to z. You can do it. There's a bunch of these questions. I encourage you to struggle with them and uh, answer them. I need to talk a little bit about flow visualization. A lot of times we're talking about steady 2D flow. When you talk about steady 2D flow, the path line, the streak line, the stream line, they all, and they all collapse to one, and we would just call it the streamline is the more common f term. Okay? So for steady flow, these three are identical. But if you get transient flow, then they become different, but rarely do we really have flow visualization needed at this level for transient flow. Go back and review the difference if you're interested in path line, streak line, and streamline. There's the definitions. Now, what about timeline? This is just makes sense. It's as if you met experimentally put a wire in a flow field and were able to release bubbles that would float with the down, and the bubbles traced like you introduced them with a little zap, and then later the bubbles showed like this. You connect those bubbles, it's a timeline. So it's an instant in time where they've been marked. Bundle of uh, streamlines is a stream tube. So you have a streamline itself. You put a little tube around it, and you get a stream tube. I think a bigger deal is made of it in the textbook than probably we need to. But take a look at it. Forget this. There's some integration to solve this problem. And this problem, if you drop a particle of fluid right here in an X, Y grid, the fluid particle ends up doing something like that in our velocity field. And it can be a little cumbersome to go ahead and figure out the streamline for a given velocity field, but I think you could do it. It starts at the point or it goes through the point one, two. What are the fluid four motions of a fluid chunk? Well, in solid mechanics, they have translation, rotation, linear strain, shear strain. In fluid mechanics, the parallel to translation is rate of translation. So instead of just moving to the x or moving to the y, it's moving to the x per unit time that gives you velocity. Rate of rotation, instead of just rotation, it looks like this. And then instead of just strain, you have linear, linear, shear, uh, linear strain rate pulling it. And then instead of just shear strain, you have shear strain rate. These four fundamental uh, types of motion I've described fluid motion, and you can bust it into those components. What is vorticity? Vorticity is given by the symbol zeta, the Greek letter. How, how many Greek letters do you know by now? Alpha, beta, gamma, theta, <laughs> delta, oh, a bunch of them. And it's del cross V. What? What's that cross? It's a cross product. So this is the cross product. Is that our del? Yeah, that's our del cross. Cr what is this also called? C-U-R-L. Curl of the velocity field. How would I compute the curl, del cross? Well, you would put a little 3 by 3 and take the determinant of it, I, J, K. And you would put 
the first one, which would be the component, the partial with respect to x, then the partial with respect to y, then the partial with respect to z. Isn't that the first, or, or the three components of del, the i, j, k component? And then u, v, and w, the three components of v. That's how you would compute the vorticity. So a lot of times we're interested in a 2D field, 2D XY field. So the vorticity is like coming out of the XY plane, the K components of interest. So what would be the K component of the vorticity? That's a bad looking K, isn't it? Wouldn't it be this matrix right here? Isn't it the partial of V with respect to X minus the partial of U with respect to Y? Yeah? So you know how to compute that. Uh, there's also the I and the J component. And you can look those up, but most of the time we're interested in two-dimensional flows for the introductory concepts and vorticity. And the, the, if you take the vorticity, it's equal to twice the angular rate of rotation. Angular rate of rotation. That's what the vorticity is. Well, you can go back and review what that curl operator is, just like the dot operator. Two vectors, do you remember? You can get the dot, two vectors, you can get the curl, and they have a lot of um, general meaning for the length of one times the length of the other times the cosine of the angle in between, or the sine of the angle in between. So some flows are rotational flows, some are irrotational. So this is a new word, irrotational, meaning it doesn't rotate. Here's a velocity profile, which is rotational. Here's a velocity profile, mathematically, which is irrotational. How do they tell? Drop a happy face in the flow, and then let it just go with the flow. Can you see that the happy face turns upside down? It's rotating. If you actually drop it in this flow field and let it rotate, because it's rotational, but it will be an irrotational flow field with this velocity profile. And the happy face will stay up. You can then calculate the vorticity. The vorticity is twice the angular rate of rotation. What is the direction of the vorticity for this two-dimensional flow? It's in the third dimension K coming out. And for the other flow field, you calculate the vorticity and you get a big zero, meaning it's irrotational. Most flow fields are rotational. Last big concept, and we got about, what, 15 minutes left, is the Reynolds transport theorem. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about a zone in space. And we talk about an enclosing surface. It's hard to do in 3D, so a lot of times we just show it in 2D. But really, you're thinking 3D. Okay? So we'll talk about a 2D. If I have a zone, a focus of the study, and I enclose it in a line, then that's my control volume. For this surface, in 3D or this line in 2D, we can talk about area vectors. Why do I draw the area vector like this for both of those sides? And if I come over here, the area vector looks like that. Tell me a little bit about the area vectors. Convention is it's always outward directed. Always. And I'm so thankful that I don't go to one book and it's, oh, this one's now the area vector is inward directed. It would be so, engineering and science is confusing enough without switching, you know. This book says it's inward directed. No, no. 
I'm so thankful. It's, every book I've seen, it's always outward directed. And so if you want a vector to describe the area, it's going to be a little unit vector, uh, let's call N, uh, with a little hat on it. What does that mean? It's, it's, it's a unit vector, length 1, and its direction is what's critical. So if I was in a, a XY uh, um, coordinate system, this one would be primarily in the X and a little bit positive in the Y. What about this one over here? Well, its uh, outward directed unit normal vector is uh, uh, negative in the X and negative in the Y. Do you see that? But the magnitude, you take each of those components, square them, add them together, take the square root, is 1 because it's unit length. So if I would say the area vector dA, it's equal to the unit outward directed normal vector at that location times the magnitude of the area. So you can talk about a little area vector as a vector or multiply a vector times a magnitude of that area. Little zone right here. What are you going to do with that little zone? Once you get it, you can integrate over all the area. But let's do this. What is V dot N? If you go back and I have a V vector right there and I have an N vector right there, just visually looking at it, it looks like this is close to a 90 degree angle. Can you tell me what is the V dot N for this problem? Zero. And then somebody says, I have another case. Here's V and here's N. What's V dot N in that case? The magnitude of V. Positive magnitude of V. Somebody says, here's V and here's N. Hey, they're opposite directions. What is the product of V dot N for this case? It'll be negative the magnitude of V. So if I have the area represented here, what I'm showing by this third case right here is it's not net inflow, it's net outflow with the negative sign indicates it's net outflow across that little DA. How about this one? It's net outflow across that little DA and what about this one? Our dA is always perpendicular to the n vector, right? So, so what about this one? It's sliding along. The fluid is sliding along that surface but not crossing in or out. There's no net flow across that boundary for that type of uh, v dot n. So this uh, product helps us when we do the summation around the enclosing surface. So what is a volumetric flow rate? Well, if I said I have a little area right here and I want to know the volumetric flow rate through it, wouldn't it be V dot N times DA, how big it is? This picks up the normal component going across and multiplies by the size. Isn't that the volumetric flow rate for a little element? All right. What about the mass flow rate? across going out. How about oh, I multiply rho times the volumetric flow rate, V dot N dA? And the last one, if I have a mass flux, what about mass flux? What do you think? What does flux mean to you? Somebody says flux. Have you seen the word flux before? What does it mean? It's like the mass flow rate per unit area. And it would be rho v dot n, some syntax like that. All right. So we're building up to the Reynolds transport theorem by going back and reviewing EA2 material, 
or if you took Cal-3, it's also in Cal-3, and a lot of people said, I take Cal-3 because it's easy, it's a great review of EA-2. Or they take Cal-3 before they take EA-2. Either one. How many people agree? How many people took Cal-3 in EA-2? Was it a lot of repeat overlap? Yeah. Didn't they have volume integrals and they have to worry about the surface integrals of some enclosing? Yeah. That's what they do. So if I have a uh, surface integral for a control volume, maybe I'm interested in that. I would get all the unit vectors normal out, and I'd have all the little DAs. And then I would do this, depending on what I wanted. I'd say the, the integrate, integral over all the DAs of n dot v rho. So this is my, my um, volumetric flow rate, my mass flow rate, and I'm doing it over the entire area. I'm summing it up. If, 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 if it's, the V is positive over here, then it's positive outflow. When I come over here to this side, N is that direction, Maybe V is this direction. It's negative outflow, hence it's inflow. So what this would be the net flow rate or the mass flow rate out of the control volume. across the boundary of the control volume. Somebody says, let's be able to do a control volume, a volume integral of the control volume. So I, I, I want to do the integral not over the area, but of the, the volume itself, dV. Well, you just have to pick. Let's say I'm interested in the mass inside the control volume. What did I, should I put right there as part of the integrand? Rho is mass per unit area. I mean, sorry, but it mass per unit volume. Then I multiply by small volume, I sum up over the entire volume, I get the mass that's in the control volume. So that's a good review of some of your math skills. So we want a conservation of mass statement for a control volume. What does it say? I have a control volume. It says the rate of change of mass inside the control volume. How does it change with time? Well, if I have more inflow than outflow, but I'm going to calculate the net outflow, right? Maybe I should put a negative sign on there. Remember the convention is the unit vector is out, outward directed. So is this equation look good if I put negative the integral over the area, rho v dot n dA, and then over here I have the time rate of change of the integral over the volume of rho dV. Why did I put a V with the hash mark through the middle of it, and over here I have V without? Because one stands for volume and one stands for velocity. Sorry, we're reusing recycling letters, right? So that can be confusing. But this is a time derivative of the volume integral. Well, here's the derivation of the Reynolds transport theorem. I've written it out so I can just kind of read it to you. Uh, the system uh, is that red line where you see the control volume. And what do we have? Uh, this zone 2 right here is shown as what's going to go out in the immediate time after. So you start at time t and you go through some small time step delta t. And it, the way that was originally developed, and I'm repeating the derivation here, is you have a, a flow outflow. Then you have zone 1 as an inflow, and they're showing you that's the fluid that's about ready to flow in over the next delta t time in across the red boundary. Okay, so what they say is they say something of the system 
generic B. It can be for energy, it can be for linear momentum, it can be for entropy, it can be for mass. But anyway, at time T plus delta T minus the T, so that's the change in the something of the system. You can just write it like this is equal to, I didn't do much there, just repeat it. But you can say, well, what is it at time T plus delta T? It's what's in the red line in the control volume at T plus delta T minus what is um, the, um, this part right here going that way. What flows out? And then the, what's in the system at time T is what is in the red line control volume at the time T minus uh, what is about ready to flow in. Does that make sense? That minus sign gets tracked down right there. And then you just rearrange and you get that uh, the rate, time rate of change of the property of the system is equal to the time rate of change within the control volume plus the rate at which it flows out minus the rate it flows in. How do I calculate within the system? Volume integral. How do I calculate the ins and outs? area integrals and decombine it into one integral because it accounts for the net outflow is positive. If it's negative, it's an inflow. There is the Reynolds transport theorem. You apply it for a mass. So you have big B of the system is the mass. Well, then you have the lowercase property B, which is the big B property system divided by the mass of the system. And so if you're interested in the mass of the system, guess what? It's just one. So you get this equation. Would this equation look reasonable? Yeah, conservation of mass. A lot of times we'll put this to the other side and we'll put a negative sign there. But something, zero is equal to the time rate of change of the mass in the control volume plus the net outflow. You use Reynolds transport theorem to do conservation of energy for a control volume. This is Reynolds transport theorem. And then you say, how can it flow in and out? Heat transfer, work from shaft, or work from boundary. And this is the volume integral. That's the area integral. Linear momentum, I'm running out of time is you say, how can it flow? How can the linear momentum of the system change if you have forces applied to the system? What type of forces? Ba body forces as well as boundary forces or pressures and normal. And then you have the volume integral and the surface integral. With that, we are done with one of the most mathematical chapters in the textbook dealing with kinematics. Uh, we reuse these things again and again. So we'll pick up next chapter and really start using the conservation of mass, conservation of momentum equations. I have your exams. Let me return them right now in the front of the room.